Um, so we hear, we've heard, especially since the last election, a lot of uh, contributors' voices, those in the Conservative Party and outside, talking about something softer on the Brexit front, and yet still the government is committed to what it set out in the so-called Lancaster House speech, where it seemed to be prioritising domestic control over the economy and trade. When you look into your Brexit a sort of crystal ball, do you think we still end up following that path that Lancaster House set out? Well, that remains the government's policy, but you're right that since the election, of course, uh, the debate has reopened a bit on the priorities for Brexit, and a lot of people are putting more emphasis on the economic issues for the future relationship, the relationship with the single market and the customs union. Uh, we don't know yet where that's going to come out, and as you said in your introduction, actually, that part of the negotiation hasn't yet really begun, because we're starting on the issues around how we separate from yeah, the EU the in the first place. Um, look, there's been lots of warning shots sent. Barnier, the chief negotiator, that trust with the UK it, it, it is a rare commodity. We can't remain idle as the clock is ticking. Do you think those kind of warnings and warnings from the financial leader of Luxembourg yesterday saying it's all happening in the media, do you think that there is any side at making concessions, perhaps behind the scenes, that we're not cognizant of in this media fracas? Well, the, the next round of the formal negotiations is beginning next week, so the formal process is starting. It's only very early on. I agree with you that you need confidence and trust on both sides in order to make that work. And actually, sort of off-scene uh, off remarks don't always help on either side. Uh, I think we need to take this very seriously as a negotiating process. Uh, the other thing is, of course, countries are talking to each other behind the scenes. Diplomacy is going on. But the, the core of this is in the formal negotiation, and until we know where that's going, uh, you can't really do an awful amount around the edges. Yeah, I mean, do you see any concessions being made at the moment? Because everybody will tell stories of victory at all stages of this, won't they, on both sides of the channel? Uh, but, uh, so, but is your reading that anybody has so far got the upper hand and, and achieved anything? Well, I don't think formal concessions have been made, but in, in a sense, the, the European Union side has the upper hand, I think, in the negotiation, because as... Barnier has said the clock is ticking, there is a time limit and we after all are the people who have asked to leave and need therefore to uh, reorganise the relationship. Uh, but I, as I said before, I think both sides need to respect the other. Uh, concessions will have to be made on both sides through this negotiation and indeed as you said earlier that we've seen the British government accepting formally that there's got to be a financial settlement which wasn't always the case uh, is in that significant? Is that significant that this has sort of been delivered in paper, paper, put on paper? Well, I think it's, an, it's a formal recognition of a fact which actually uh, was known. <laughs> uh, the question, no, no. Uh, yes, and the, I think the British government has actually previously uh, recognised that this was the case. The question is, can we reach agreement on the basis for that settlement rather than just having uh, numbers bandied around without any sort of substantive evidence behind them? What's the significance of the repeal bill in all of this uh, then, uh, Simon? Is this something that just gums up the process, slows us down? Uh, does it trigger a sort of softer Brexit or is it it's all about the labour market that we achieve after Brexit? What was the significance but, no, the, of it? The repeal bill is incredibly important because it is the mechanism by which we are going to make sure that when Brexit happens we have legal continuity for people and for businesses operating in this country and if we don't have that yeah. by importing uh, European regulation and law into this country, we will be in a very tricky situation. So it's a really important And what's the thing. result of the opposition party saying that they won't support it at this stage? Well, what we've seen at the moment, of course, is a reflection of the fact that domestic politics in this country after the election is more complicated on Brexit. You only need seven Conservative MPs to agree with the opposition side to put the government in trouble. And we saw that, for example, over Euratom where uh, the government has said it wants to withdraw from the Euratom Treaty, which covers, uh, covers nuclear uh, matters. Uh, and uh, um, uh, now they're having to backtrack on that because we haven't really yet thought through the full implications of it. Well, they're trying to find, I think late last night, the, the story is that they're trying to find some kind of fudged oversight in, in, in that regard. Um, Liam Fox, we caught up with him yesterday, and Anna and I spoke to the chair of the British Chambers of Commerce, Alan, yeah. Adam Marshall. Fox would maintain that he'd be very happy with a few months of a transition period. Yeah. Optimistic, I would say. Uh, British Chambers of Commerce, Adam Marshall says their members say three years as being the minimum they need and want for transition. Months, I, I, I put it to you, sir, it, it is optimistic. You, yeah. Your view on transition period? No, well, I mean, clearly, in my view, there will have to be a transition period because you can't negotiate this agreement and implement it in two years. 
that's unrealistic. So is your mind forming in three or five? It's going to be m not months, it's going to be years, I think, if we're going to have an effective, smooth transition to a new arrangement, assuming that that arrangement is negotiated. What are the chances that the whole thing collapses, Simon? We saw we heard Vince Cable saying that he thinks, you know, maybe this whole thing could collapse within the year. You've suggested that there could be votes of some form, either within Parliament, probably preferably, in your view, within Parliament, that change the course of Brexit or decide to reject it altogether? What, what is the chance that that So happens? there is clearly a risk that this negotiation will collapse at some point because we can't reach agreement on very tricky issues and the domestic politics is complicated as well. I think what we've got to do at this point is get on with it, travel down the road of negotiation as best we can. We don't know yet what the destination is going to be.